thank you for joining us this evening, Mr. Joshua. Thank you. How are you feeling, me. especially after what just happened in the uh, old library? What, the chest? Yeah. Um, not a good start, but <laughs> we're here. Thank you for having me. Um, this is different, obviously, boxing, silence, going there, showing my talent. Speaking, it's like asking all of you guys to go and have a boxing match for two rounds. I'm sure you'll feel uncomfortable, so please bear with me, excuse any mistakes, but I'm going to just try and have some fun. Thank you. Uh, speaking about some fun, um, before we came into the chamber, uh, we had a little fun um, outside, well, in, in our old debating chamber. Do you want to yeah. tell us a bit about what happened um, in that room? With a chess? Yeah. I met one of your free time champions. I don't know if she's in here. Gave me, gave, humbled me. Like, there's a certain level that you play to normally, right? Where you think that you're good. Um, you normally find your playing ground, and this is at a level that I'm not used to. But I blamed it on the chessboard that I'm not used to because different <laughs> chessboards, different pieces. So hopefully, I'll get a rematch one of these days. And um, I'll be honored to come back and play for sure because I love chess. Does anyone else in here play chess? Yeah? Yeah, so I, I enjoy it. It's a good game. It's something I do online normally. Because I don't have time to sit down and play because I'm always training. So online normally, if anyone's got the chess app, feel free to add me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll definitely play uh, anyone in here. So yeah, we've Amazing. played some chess before. Yeah, of course, a little bit. Um, I, I wouldn't dare play you in chess or other games. Um, so what you're known for, of course, is boxing. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell us a bit about how and why you got into boxing? How and why I got into boxing? Um, how? How I got into boxing, basically, not the long story, but I grew up in Watford and I was actually banned from the area. I used to get in a lot of trouble when I was younger. So I'm 32 now and at the age of 17, I was finding myself in a lot of trouble. So I moved up to Edgware, moved to Burnt Oak, moved to Golders Green and my cousin. So my cousin was boxing at the time and as they say, uh, birds of a feather flock together. So normally the environment you're in, you're in is going to shape your future, right? The, the friends you keep. So my cousin was boxing. So I decided to follow him down to the gym. I was driving at the time, so I used to drive him there. And sitting here like this, like along the back row, we would watch all the athletes training. And I used to think, I could do this, you know. But, you know, watching from a distance, normally like armchair fans, is a lot easier than uh, actually doing it. So I actually got involved and I found um, a passion for it because I started watching documentaries about how people change their lives through sport. And um, that was really like the, the moment that I got the addiction for it because it wasn't so much, I want to be heavyweight champion of the world. That's not the dream. The dream was to change the way I was living. So, you know, like smoking, raving, um, the kind of music I would listen to. I wasn't actually reading books at the time, so I read, I read a lot of champions, used to spend time reading books and stuff, educating themselves. At the time, Vladimir Klitschko was um, a champion who he was, um, I think he had a, a, a master's or something in medicine, spoke like five languages, which boxers are known to have like, you know, broken noses and be like, duh, uh. Uh, uh, like not string a sentence together, yeah. So, so I wanted to educate myself because um, I only really went college. I studied music, and I left the education system because I went. I wanted to get into the real world and earn money. But um, yeah, so that's when I went into boxing. I used it for those benefits as well to educate myself and better my lifestyle. Yeah, before we came down here, you spoke about how um, as an athlete, there's lots of expectations. Some, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and. Yeah. One, you're an athlete, one, you're an educator, one, you're a role model. Could you tell us, in your, by your own definition, who you would define the real athlete Joshua is at the core? At the core? Yeah. That's a good question. After all these years of the questions I've had, I still can't figure out a direct answer. So it's subject to change, yeah? Because different times of people's lives, they, they go through things that change them. But right now, if I'm honest, um, it's about the money. <laughs> you know, money is an interesting subject. It's a topic that doesn't get spoken about a lot, but it's one that makes the world go round. Um, 
one of the biggest things to shake up the financial industry is crypto, right? <laughs> so like you can see how much of an impact finances has on our life. And, you know, growing up, you know, always I want to be a millionaire. I think that's changed now. Property prices, inflation, all that type of stuff. So you, you have to set your, your standards and goals higher. It's hard. It's hard, really hard to achieve. Everyone achieves at different times, like being a millionaire at 18 or 20 or 25 or 30 is not realistic. Sometimes, it, you know, 60 you might crack it. Sometimes it might be your grandkids who crack it. So those dreams and desires, though, are what, what definitely is at the core of who I am, trying to be uh, successful. In sport, it's more passion, you know, because I've done it a long time for free. And uh, like I still train for months and months for free. I know there's um, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, for example, but it's not every day I'm getting paid to do what I do. But definitely outside of boxing, uh, as a young man, I definitely want to be uh, stable. And it's not just for self. I don't do it just for self. Um, I'm also looking at, I structured it so much that it was the finances where I put money at the core of me because I've seen a lot of my my elder aunties, uncles, mum, dad struggle. So the goal was to take care of them um, and then skip my generation because I feel we're still young enough and we've got enough, you know, grease in our elbows to, to work. So skip that generation and then build for the next generation. So our generation, we try to set up a lot of businesses and be independent. And then once I've achieved that now, we're now giving back to communities as well. So. Uh, that's where I get the drive to generate income is not just for self, but I can help a lot of people. Wow. Obviously, you're a ninja boy. Yeah. Um, this inner hustle that you have to sort of like not just fend for yourself, yeah. the family, yeah. extending. Where do you think that stems from? More importantly, how can people in the audience, for example, cultivate the kind of drive that you have to sort of like think beyond yourself and persevere to, you know, protect everyone around you? Where did it cultivate from? Um, so, as I speak from now, and probably looking back, uh, it probably stems from, I like, for example, like the alpha male, you know, like look at the, the people that you have, I'm not too sure who they are, but they are probably, <laughs> probably some dominant figures back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I like, when I listen to a lot of um, old gladiators and warriors and people as such, they conquered, they, they had that drive. So I use that as a hustle, right? I take it into my, into my lifestyle. So how can I dominate an industry? And look, not, not everyone has that mindset, but I feel everyone has to play a position. And I think I found mine in my industry. And... I got to play my position right. It's difficult because there's a lot of uh, distractions now where back in the day, a lot of conquerors didn't have like a nightclub on every corner, <laughs> you know, and, and a subway or Nando's uh, to go to. So, you know, they'll sit around a fireplace and congregate and talk under the stars and stuff like that. But now it's not like that as such. So it's hard, but definitely I, I like basically watching a lot of conquerors every morning, more, more times than none, I wake up and I watch a documentary on YouTube. So I just connect it to my speaker, my little Beats pill. And while I'm getting ready, I listen to the ways of a warrior and conqueror. And it just kind of sets my mind straight for what I'm going to try and achieve. That's amazing. There's also like a, a very good um, channel that you can use to watch really good documentaries on and really good talks. It's called the Oxford YouTube channel. So if you want to subscribe to that too. Yeah, I was um, watching that already. I watched that. I watched that. <laughs> So that's all the people that come here to talk, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this place definitely looks familiar from what I've seen on YouTube. So it's an <laughs> honour, honestly, it's an honour. So yeah. We love that, we I love that. people come here and talk before. Um, going back to what you spoke about, um, sort of like going back to your youth, um, mm. what memories do you have specifically of the time you had in boarding school uh, back in Nigeria? Yeah. And, and how, what role does that play in the nostalgia you feel to connect back home? Because I know you went back um, a couple of years ago to give back and stuff. So, um, so talk more about your, your connection to, to that and how that uh, imbues who you are today. So going back home. Um, so you, so 
you don't know what's beyond the four walls you live in. And like my parents, it was interesting because in our house was very cultural towards Nigerian heritage. And then, but I wasn't so much, I wasn't born in Nigeria, but I knew I was Nigerian, you know, family, um, even the name Femi. Um, it's Anthony Olua Femi Olasheni Joshua. But all through my youth, I was known as Femi, which is quite a unique name where I grew up. And um, it was only when I started boxing that you have to go by the name on your passport. But I was always understood at my Nigerian heritage. And then boarding school was quite an interesting experience. And it's a lot different to state like normal school. But boarding school in Nigeria, like it's, discipline is at the forefront. <laughs> discipline was at the forefront for sure. But at the same time, I think that's helped me a lot in life because as I said, I wasn't, well like now, I'm not saying I'm highly educated, but I, I think with good manners and you know, little things, no thank you, yes please, um, standing up for your elders, you know, on, like in certain cultures, as you get older, you become useless. But the old carry so much wisdom in our culture and you're, you seem to be valued more, you know. So I was around a lot of older people when I was in, obviously in boarding school and the discipline that it taught me helped me because as an athlete coming through that needed to excel at a quick rate because I started at 18. I didn't start as a young kid, so I needed to get through the ranks quick. I was guided by a lot of people with wisdom and I think they wanted to help me because they saw a young kid that was getting in trouble, wanted to make a change. So when you see someone who actually wants to win and wants to help themselves more than, like, I want to help that kid, for example. So if I'm older and I want to help a youth, someone younger than me, but I can see that they want it more and they're more receptive to the information I'm telling them, then I'm going to want to probably help them a little bit more. So I was that kid that was, thank you, I've read what you've told me to read, I've researched it, I appreciate your time, thank you so much. And it helped me in that sense, in terms of discipline, like ironing your clothes was a big part of um, boarding school. Cleanliness, I think that's so important, like your room. So I always felt if I could, if I could keep my room tidy and organised, I could probably conquer the world, you know. So that was always part of being in boarding school, you know, cleanliness, organisation. And lastly, I'd say it taught me to accept people for their differences. So different cultures, um, like even in Nigeria, it's a place that has, like, I think, 200 million people. So there's so many different tribes. It's kind of like Welsh, English, like, you know, like Scousers, Manchester. Eng so like different people, with different cultures, different values. So growing up, in, in, in the UK, then boarding school, it taught me to accept people for their differences as well. And that's helped a lot as well. So there's so many benefits. There's so many benefits of going to boarding school at a young age. Yeah, um, so like at a young age, you've assimilated a lot of new information and quickly developed, just it's emulated in your career, starting um, boxing quite late and then going on to pretty much um, quite easily beating up all the opponents that came against you. Um, Not all, <laughs> unfortunately. Just very quickly, yeah. in the experience of having a breeze through most of the fights you had in your mm -hmm. career, what went through your mind on that first knockdown with Ruiz? With Ruiz? Hang on a minute, this one part of the scripts. <laughs> 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 um, but like, when I studied the, the, the greats before and I studied boxing, anyone who competes at the highest level, time and time and time and time again, normally a lot of the great champions take a loss along the way. So I knew when I fought for the world championship belt uh, in my 16th fight, which is fairly early, um, I just predicted there's going to be a blip in my career. And I always said to myself, um, who am I without the belts? Who am I sitting here? I'm not, a, I'm not a champion right now, but who am I without the belts? So even when I took that hit and it started unfolding, that championship status, you know, started as the rounds went on and then finally Ruiz became champion. I wasn't champion anymore. 
I'd already prepared myself for the stumbling blocks of, of the game I'm in. And it's about rebuilding as well, but staying strong and staying championship mindset, even though you don't have the title. So with or without the titles, with or without, you know, the, the degree that you guys are chasing or whatever it may be, it's about like internally like believing, I feel, and if you get what I'm trying to say. So when I took that knock, it's just part of the journey I'm on. And it may have been like that. I may have lost the next fight because I had to fight the same guy that just beat me. Yeah, so what's to say that I was guaranteed a win? But I went in there knowing that this is part of a journey and it may be like this for a year. You know, I may have a, a troubled time during my career for a year, maybe two years, but because I felt within myself I've got a champion spirit to keep on going, even though things aren't going my way, time, time is the best healer. And with time, things will get better for sure. So that's, that's how it was. I just take it as it comes and this is just part of the process. You've got obviously a rematch coming up with Usyk. Yes. How would you define him as an opponent? So <clears throat> Usyk's um, class is a pound for pound opponent. I still don't know what that means. Um, the things I know in boxing is winning and people like knockouts. I've never been into scores. I've never been into pound for pound. I've never really been into rankings. But I just understand people like knockouts and people like winners. So he's a pound for pound. What I've come to understand that means is that he's one of the best across all divisions. They mix them and see who the best is. He's one of the best. And for me personally, <clears throat> what Usyk means to me is someone who I've fought that stays true to my values. And that is fighting the best of this generation. Um, so you have boxers that you knock out that make you look good, which is like, it's like eye candy in boxing. But Usyk is a top tier opponent, an Olympic gold medalist, um, a former cruiserweight, undisputed champion, now heavyweight champion. And I think someone that should go down in boxing history. And I take him on in three months. So God willing, with prayers and hard work, I'll get the win and I will become three-time heavyweight champion of the world. So I'm just putting it out there now. <laughs> <laughs> Every, every boxer obviously has a game plan in their head. Yeah. I'm not going to tease out your game plan with you, so I'm not going to give him the cheat sheet. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I was just wondering, with the pressure yeah. that goes into what occurs in that ring, mm. how often does that game, game plan, plan execute itself? Was it the case when uh, I think there's a quote saying everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face come in? So, a game plan. If I'm honest with you, this is the first time in my career, I would say we are specifically working to a game plan. So it will all, it will all make sense after July 23rd. I, I base a lot of my success on raw ability with the right coaches, experienced coaches, but they probably knew I had ability. So it's just about nurturing that ability. So then what tends to happen is we overthink things too much when there isn't a game plan because things don't always go our way when it's based on, upon raw ability. So I believe that when I started looking at social media, now you're seeing so many different aspects of training and stuff. So raw ability wasn't enough. Um, so now I'm going to try out this new, this new like game plan training that you're saying and see how it goes. But I believe you have to have an A, B and C. And I'm only as good as my team if I'm honest with you, I'm quite stubborn. If you told me to go out there and knock this guy out, I believe I'll be able to do that. Like the fight with Usyk in my mind was go to 12 rounds. That was my game plan because I felt I could compete with him as a boxer. And I think he won two more rounds than I did how he became champion. So the goal now is to go back to basics and go for the knockout. And someone with that desire and passion that wants to take this guy out. And I always felt when I'm sparring people or fighting people, I actually see, um, their spirit get dampened, honestly, like, cause you're looking at this person direct in their eyes, watching their body language and I can read the body language, punch after punch that this person is slowly gonna fade. Now when you're boxing, the art of boxing is to hit and not get hit. So you're kind of boxing to stay away. That's not really my style. My style is to be up close and personal and make it difficult for the person. So that's the game plan. And now I, before it was just on raw ability, 
as I said, fighting for the championship in 16 fights is kind of unheard of because you're still developing. So there's a lot of rawness still that you need to polish. Now I feel polished, I'm experienced, I've lost, I've came back. I fought the best of this era, yet to still fight a few people. One that's retired recently. Um, <laughs> one in America that we don't know what's happening. So a few more top tier fighters that I want to add to my resume. And I feel as a more experienced person with a lot more character, due to the things I've been through, I shall uh, follow out uh, game plans, but also use that raw spirit that I've had, not just depending on that. I feel like I've added more to my, my arsenal. Yeah, um, speaking of the one who just retired, recently um, White uh, had a fight and mm. um, the conclusion wasn't quite as you predicted. Um, given that, how in your mind present are you eager to get into the boxing ring with Fury and is that more so than the, the game plan with, I mean, it's preparation for you, sir. So, the minute I turned pro, I hadn't even had my first fight yet and they were saying I should fight these guys because uh, I started boxing in 2008 and so that's when I first entered the boxing gym and then Tyson Fury had turned professional so he had a long amateur career so he turned professional a year after so these were the guys leading the pack so there's normally so what it is there's four year cycles in Olympics every four years there's a cycle if you're good enough to make it through a cycle you could, I started boxing in 2008. By 2012, I had gone to all the amateur championships, won, 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 and turned professional. So I was the next crop coming after Tyson Fury. So if, if Fury would uh, honor the boxer's agreement and come out of retirement, because ultimately, as you asked me at the start, going back to boxing, what is at my core? It's about the money. <laughs> <laughs> If you will come out and honour the gentleman's agreement, there's a lot of money to be made. And I know that money could help a lot of people as well. So ultimately, first and foremost, I have a, a pound for pound fighter on my list with Usyk. who's a tough competitor for sure, but people say I only focus on what's in front of me, which is a good way to think. But also I want to look at what the bigger picture holds so I can steamroll through what I have to so I can get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So for sure, I feel retirement doesn't mean that you've completely given up and you're on the beach, clicking your toes, drinking a bottle of Corona. I feel he's still ticking over and he'll come back if the right fight was presented to him. Exciting. I mean, you're by no means like wanting right now for um, financial need. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Anyone got any business ideas in there? <laughs> I know you guys are the future, <laughs> some the present. So yeah, I think I would definitely like to get my fingers in more pies. Uh, thinking about other reasons why you get up in the morning, could you yeah. talk to us about um, what in your life right now means so much to you and what makes you smile the most when, you're, when you get up in the morning? So this is an aura ring. <laughs> so when I check my sleep and I've had more than seven hours, I'm like, oh, I'm ready for the day. So for me, sleep is something that I value so much. And believe it or not, it's the simple, small things that, that charge me up. So I don't actually, I don't live in a mansion. I don't live behind gates. My, my driveway's open. <laughs> um, I'm a man of the community as well. So I don't need much. I feel, as I said, um, my goals at the minute, that, that why I get up is to um, support the people that have got a vested interest in me. So I feel I can't fail because it will, it will crumble a lot of people's empires that are building alongside me. So I've got a responsibility to, to achieve, to also help people around me. So it's not just about me. That, that's what gets me up in the morning and keeps me smiling, keeps me motivated. And as I said, um, there's a lot of people I can help through the business that I'm involved in. But ultimately for me, it all comes down to how I sleep. If I sleep good, I can conquer the day. And it's the small things that make the bigger picture for me. What makes you smile in the morning? <laughs> Food. Food? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your breakfast? Uh, not breakfast, more, more like a nice brunch. Or maybe okay, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe when I, when I go home once in a while and mum has made that uh, goosey and a pound of jam. Has I... anyone ever tried pound of jam in here? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I can see a lot of the African Caribbean hands going up. <laughs> so maybe we need to have a Nigerian day in the in the uh, uni. There's the World Foods Festival um, coming later this time. Is there a World <laughs> Food Festival happening? Yeah, there is. If you want to come back, um, we, we got a good scene of that. So. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to. I would Definitely. love to, honestly. Uh, so there's a lot of international students in here as well. Yeah. Absolutely. That's good. That's good. And that's Sweet. what going to Nigeria taught me as well, like different cultures and stuff like that. So I love, I love cultural food and cultural understanding of people's backgrounds. Yeah, and Nigerians, obviously, one thing that a theme is their emphasis on education. Yeah. And yeah. many, you know, people from disadvantaged backgrounds sort of like find refuge in different activities that they mm. escape the environment from. Yeah. Um, some choose boxing instead of yeah. education. Um, if you were to maybe um, speak to the young youth of today, yeah. um, what path would you advocate um, between educational boxing Boxing? Mm. Hmm. What, what would I advocate? Boxing or education? Education's hard. So is boxing. <laughs> 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 education, wow. I, honestly, I admire you guys. Um, the brain power, the amount of reading you guys do, the pressure from your teachers and exams and what else is there that you have to do? Mock exams, what's the... Collections. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> so, <laughs> but... I feel right now I'll probably go down the education route because I believe a smart person can make a smart boxer. A dumb person will make a bad boxer. So you have to be, I've, that's basically saying I'm pretty smart. <laughs> if I'm saying it. So, so I feel you have to be somewhat smart and witty and have like ability to make decisions, crucial decisions, um, to predict outcomes and stuff like that. You have to, I have to do research. I have to do my own research. I spend time studying. We was in the car on the way up, connecting my phone and it, you know, boxing came on and I told my friend, ah, you're, you're into my research and development, you know? So I'm just in tune with it. So yeah, education for me is the foundation of all things possible. Yeah, you're speaking right now about balancing two aspects. You know, you've been the sporting athlete but also trying to make sure you're cleared up on education mm. um also you're quite the entrepreneur yourself if i do say so um how do you balance these life obligations in the sporting aspirations how where, where do you find time to ensure you're making the right business investments making sure you're signing the right um uh, merchandise deals and so on what up on the time how do you balance it i don't i break down a lot it's hard <laughs> it's hard you know um <clears throat> It's hard, man, honestly. <clears throat> I, never, I never thought I'd be moving more into the business realm when I first started boxing. Um, but as I said to you earlier, right, as an athlete, you move up the ranks and then you become a voice of politics, a voice of religion. You become, <clears throat> you know, your family accountant, your family financier. So you become all these things. You become the family businessman. So. <sighs> I'm at the stage now, someone can come to me and say, bro, trust me, let's open a gym. I say, bro, trust me, who was the first heavyweight champion? So where I'm coming to in that is, people expect me to have an understanding of how to open a gym and make it successful, but they have no interest in understanding how to become a successful boxer and what it takes. So how do I balance it? It's, it's about your team and being honest with the people around you um, and letting them know that it's not your priority. You're able, you're capable, I'm more than capable of opening a business and investing in simple, low risk investments because the capital has already been made. We're not trying to make high risk investments. I think that's not the route we're trying to go down. So we're trying to invest in low risk investments, but just, just being true, what are you capable of doing and what aren't you capable of doing? It's as simple as that and the team I'm around. I, I'm around a lot of people that are probably smarter than me um, in certain industries. And as I said, um, <clears throat> a lot of the elder generation that want to help me is because they see I'm keen to learn. The negatives of that is it takes a lot of time away from my true craft and what it takes to be one of the top tier athletes is so time consuming. But I do know um, at the core of it all, it's about the money. <laughs> so I understand that boxing doesn't last forever, right? We all, sports careers are short. 
I was very well aware of this when I first started boxing. At 18, when I turned pro in 2013, I realised um, I have a short space of time to make my name a global name across all of the world because we want to attack different regions when we're selling our broadcasting rights and when I'm doing deals globally, territories, America, Africa, Asia, um, Europe, all these different territories, what makes them want to invest into small little me from a council estate compared to, for example, the guy who's retired? So I knew that I had to think smart on these things like that. So yeah, it's just, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting balance when you're just trying to be a good athlete, but you have to look at the, the business end of what you're trying to achieve as well. So you guys have got a, a goal that you're trying to achieve at the end of all of this, right? It's the same thing with an athlete. This is the boxing industry, you know, the university, the, the university of hard knocks. That's the boxing realm. And then you progress into the real world and we have to make that transition because we see athletes that once they finish their career, turn to drugs, alcohol, make bad decisions because they didn't set themselves up for after. And I'm trying to avoid that pitfall. Um, I want my name in the media for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. So business, 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 I love it. I'm around good people that want to help me. So I'm not, who's into, who's, who wants to invest? Who wants to be an entrepreneur in here? What ideas have you got for your future? <laughs> um? uh, well, I'm currently working on a legal startup with a concern with legal tech. Okay. It's involving more AI and artificial intelligence and decision making of the law. Okay, decision making of the law. No, no more need for lawyers. <laughs> so I think there's some people in here studying law. <laughs> So that's interesting, no more lead for lawyers. That's interesting, so entrepreneur, um, but he's studying as well at the same time. So you just got to balance, find time to balance. One final question for me before I open up to audience questions. Yeah. Um, obviously we spoke earlier on about how perhaps sporting stars and icons resent this idea that you know, they're role models and but the actual reality is that people do look up to you. Um, for whatever reason, mm. and they look at and aspire to either emulate your success. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to someone who might be currently down on the luck or maybe taking a couple run left turns and is struggling to kind of get the habit to get back on the path they didn't meant to be on? What advice would you give to, to any of us or anyone watching right now about finding who they are and who they want to be? Find out who's struggling finding about who they are, who they want to be, down on luck. It's, it's um, yeah, when, okay. <clears throat> Sixth round against Vladimir Klitschko. I was up, then boom, I'm down on my luck. I'm flat on my back. And back to the, back to the things I used to listen to in the morning. I said I listened to a lot of the conquerors. Uh, so they say, when you're on your back, if you can look up, that means you can what? That's it. That means you can stand up. That means you can get up. So if you're on your back, it doesn't mean that's where you belong. <clears throat> it's going to be tough to get back up, but it definitely means that you can get up. You know, when you look at, look, I just thought of it now, a little insect on the floor that's on their back. Their main priority is to get back up. Same, same philosophy. You have to try and get back up. And... Um, just look at yourself in the mirror sometimes. Take time out. Question yourself. Who am I? That's what I question myself. Without these belts around my waist, which people know me as, that's what kind of broadcasted my name to the world is fighting for the championships. One day, <clears throat> that's going to be gone. These, these two seats are always going to be here, but I'm going to transition off into my own world and one day you will move on and someone else will come and fill these seats. Like, who are you? Who are you once these seats aren't meant for you? This does not always going to have Anthony Joshua written on this seat. The belts aren't always going to have Anthony Joshua written on them. So I have to have that mentality to always be able to get up even when the chips are down. And there was times when the chips were down. They're down right now, but I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. And it takes a strong character. I'm not saying it's easy, it does take a lot of character to be able to keep on moving forward. 
Obviously, it's not all doom and gloom. Have fun, like meet your friends, go out. But there are quiet times. There are definitely quiet times. And I just think who you are in those quiet times is what kind of shapes you in times like these when we're out with our friends or audiences and stuff like that, or in the real world. So I don't know if that answered the question, but when you're down and out, you can definitely get back up. If you can look up, you can get up. And in your quiet times, what I've learned to do is listen to great conquerors, people that have been you know, in tough situations and understand how they get out of those situations. So when I say in your quiet times, my quiet times are in the mornings when I'm getting ready. I tend to listen to things that can help me get through tough times. And it was actually someone called Les Brown. Does anyone listen to Les Brown, a motivational speaker in here? Anyone know of him? Yeah? So he, that's where I heard that saying. And actually, <clears throat> when I was knocked down in round six, it actually came to my mind after about four seconds when I got my senses <laughs> back. But after about four seconds when I got my senses back, it, honestly, it came to me and I thought, that's it. If I can look up, I can get up. And I just got up and I cracked on. And through more trials and tribulations, I went out and got the knockout in round 11. And um, yeah, so in those quiet times, in a moment when I needed it, my, my subconscious mind reverted back to my quiet times. Profound. Thank you so much. Um, no, thank you very much. I'm going to open up to some questions <coughs> in the audience. Um, please, should you be selected, wait for one of our lovely um, mustardy members of the committee to hand you a mic before you stand up and ask the question. So I recognise the gentleman with a black jacket here. Do we need a mic? Yeah. Okay. Hello, AJ. Thank you for a good talk, mate. Um, who is the hardest opponent you've come up against in your boxing career to date? The hardest opponent I've came up against would be um, Vladimir Klitschko. Definitely. It's the passing of the guard. The young lion versus the old lion. Um, at the time when I fought him, I feel it was definitely too early. But as that was his, I fought him on his last fight. So if I didn't fight him then, it would have been too late. So it was a risk versus reward. And I felt boxing needed it. And sometimes due to lack of experience, we make it harder than it needs to be. But he was definitely like, he's had more knockouts on his record than I have fights and knockouts combined. The guy is like very experienced, very, very strong. And um, he gave me a tough fight. Before that stage, I was knocking guys out within six rounds, seven rounds. Vladimir took me 11 rounds, somewhere that I'd never been before, but he was, yeah, he was my toughest for sure. Did you watch that one? I was there. You was there? <laughs> is it? You enjoy it? Yeah. All right, all right for summer. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Right, I recognise that gentleman there with the blue shirt. You're picking friends. Favouritism. <laughs> Wait, hold up. Do I know you? <laughs> Hi, uh, how concerned are you about MMA taking over boxing as a number one combat sport? Very interesting. Well, I think I'll be well and truly gone by that stage. But I don't think it will, in my humble opinion, because of the history, the long history of boxing. So I'm going to counter-attack that. I'm going to say, because of like, boxing is an Olympic sport, so that long history where people come from the amateurs, so how it starts in boxing, you become the best in your region, my region, London. Then I become the best in England. Then England versus Wales, Scotland. And then once you become the best in Great Britain, then you go on and represent Great Britain, and I fight Russia, I fight Cuba, I fight all these countries all around the world, some of the toughest competitors, and then you transition into the professional ranks. So that history, all around the world this is happening. So everyone transitions into the professional ranks to try and do the same thing. I feel MMA, because it hasn't got that, um, that long history where what it is is you, there's stars like McGregor and these type of people, but that history, that transitions from the amateurs to the pros. That's why I think boxing will always be one of the top tier sports. And even if you look at ancient times, boxing has always been in like the gladiatorial days as well. So there's just history. Like I come here, what separates this place from many other places like universities and unions is the history. 
even though there might be a new, a new building or a new university that has state-of-the-art facilities and all this stuff, this place is very um, historical. <laughs> Seen some cracks in some walls, but that's what, that's what makes this what it is. <laughs> That's what makes this place what it is, you know? And that's the same as boxing. The history of it is why certain places, they're nice, they're glitz, they're glam. MMA is amazing, entertaining, but the history of boxing is, is second to none. Yeah, on that note, the history of this place is also what makes a very sound investment <laughs> for any future. <laughs> investment? So about, let me get my note. <laughs> right, uh, I recognise uh, the lady with the scarf. Hi, um, my question's about mental health and how I guess you bounce back, especially with a lot of pressure, because you said there's a lot of people sort of um, linked to you that um, I guess look up to you and mm. yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, mental health. So, in an African household, <laughs> honestly, is there, a, is there a thing? You have to be so strong. You have to be so strong and sometimes I feel I may have suffered but I mean mask it you have you know um, but I think it's being spoken about more which I think is really good which I think is really good because you can it's good to have a shoulder to lean on a shoulder to cry on sometimes just to talk sometimes I, I think I talk to a lot of people and they think what's he rabbiting on and what's he like rabbiting on about but it's just me getting off my chest so I don't know if I've suffered, but if I have, I think I've found ways to deal with it and coping mechanisms where I have a strong you know, team around me, like some trusted friends that I can speak to certain things about. Um, what advice would you give someone? Because I, I, as I said, I think I masked it well. So if you've suffered or you know anyone that suffered, what advice would you give someone like myself? Because I don't, I don't have all the answers. Um, so I'm learning as well along my journey. No, I guess I'd say just seek help. Like there's no sort of harm or shame in doing so, whether that's, you know, speaking to friends, family. Um, some yeah. people turn to medication if you need it. Um, yeah. Like the support networks, I think. And for me, like faith, God, those, yeah. you know, it's very important. Definitely. So, Prayer is important prayer. as well. Definitely. Well done with that one. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Right, um, I recognise the <laughs> Whoa, member with way. the bangles on their hand right there, yep. Yeah. Just, just, yeah. But I, I want some of this, this money that they're paying you. you know? <laughs> I on that list, they're like, all right, yeah, he's over there. <laughs> So obviously a lot of people hugely respect and admire you, not just for like your success, but the way you carry yourself. Um, so is there anyone else in sport or elsewhere that you really admire for like the way they approach sport or the responsibility that comes with their position? They hit the nail on the head. Vladimir Klitschko was one of the guys that I looked up to when I first started because um, it's not really wanting to be a champion, it's the responsibilities that come with being a champion. And I felt like he, as I said, educated himself. Um, uh, he spoke different languages. You know, he wore like suits and stuff. So when I was coming through as a young man, I didn't want to be like big chains, like not educating myself properly, talking a certain way. So he, he inspired me, man. And um, people used to say, oh, Joshua's fake. He's this, he's that for wanting to better myself. But um, you stay strong through the criticism because I knew like the guy that I looked up to is someone that inspired me. It wasn't maybe not inspiring for someone else, but I looked up to him and yeah, my idol became my rival, but we have a great relationship still. And um, anyone coming up, I'd definitely say, be mindful about the position you're in for sure. You know, I've made mistakes I've made mistakes coming up, sometimes saying the wrong thing, being in the wrong places, but it's always from a good place at the end of the day. And it's part of the responsibility of being a champion. Speaking of which, really quickly, what was on that memory stick that Klitschko handed you? Sorry? Do you know what? I, um, 
so yeah, Klitschko, yeah. So we're at a press conference now. And he said, I've got a memory stick sewn into my gown that is going to break down how I defeat Anthony Joshua. Because I went to his training camp um, in 2014. I went to help him prepare for a fight. So what they do, they, like you guys record, they record all the training sessions. And then in 2017, was it? In 17, I fought Vladimir Klitschko. So you asked me what was on it. So funny enough, after the fight, so I sent the invoice, it cleared. So I rang my guys, I'm like, yeah, I want to put a bid in for this uh, stick. Because he put it out for auction. He was going to donate the funds to his charity. So I called my guys, I was like, yeah, I'm ready to put in a bid for this stick. Let's call it five grand. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, that's, quite, that's a lot of money, no? It's a lot of money. I think it sold for something like 200 grand or something like that, 200 or something grand. So yeah, I'd never got to see what was on it. I've never heard what was on it. And I was a, a long way off the mark of what it needed to take. Do you reckon maybe we reason you sit got a hand of it before? <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> no, don't worry, nothing's going to kick off, we're cool. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, huh? he's got a good bounce, he says. <laughs> <laughs> right, oh, um, really quickly. Um, Someone that you don't know. I don't know any of these people. <laughs> um, right, the gentleman right here. Oh, sorry, it's far walk. Apologies. Um, hi, Mr. Joshua. Hello, sir. Um, thank you for speaking. Um, <laughs> you I was going to ask, what do you think you'd have got into if you didn't get into boxing? And do you think you still would have found yourself in that different avenue? I wouldn't have found myself in that different avenue. And I know that um, the environment I'm in shapes me as a person because um, I was actually bricklaying at the time. So when I was training, um, I had to work. I had a few different jobs. But at the time, I was bricklaying a lot. Has anyone seen the Lucas Aid advert that I'd done? So, yeah, so that's kind of like a little bit, a little like 30 second clip of the process through boxing. So, bricklaying was a big part of that transition. I was actually studying, I was doing bricklaying as well. I went to West Hearts College, done music, got in trouble, then moved to London. So, I went to Barnet College and studied construction. So, I was bricklaying. And funny enough, why your environment shapes you on site. I'm not a drinker, but all the guys will talk about is, yeah, I'm going down the pub after, I'm going to have a few beers. So at the time I'm boxing, one day, like probably six months into my, um, what was I, what, what do they call them again? Um, you're not a bricklayer at the time, you do like, is it the grout or the, no? I'm sure no one in here is into bricklaying. <laughs> <laughs> Studying bricklaying. You, you nod your head, what's it called? No, in the mustard top. <laughs> what's it called? Screeding. Screeding, something like that, right? <laughs> so I would just listen. So one day I'm on my way home, I caught the bus home, stopped off in the shop, and because I'm now in that environment of Brick Lane, um, talking about drinks and beers and weekends, having access to certain uh, substances, I bought, <laughs> I bought a six pack of Heineken. And I got into that routine of drinking like two cans and just like crashing out, honestly, on the sofa. So I think that I would have probably found a different person to who I am now. Maybe the same, tall, like the gym, but definitely not the same values. So the values, like the environment of work, like boxing values, which is eat clean, healthy, watch videos, research and development, talk to people like yourself, learn from people. I was around... Um, people that were like eight years old, like my coaches and stuff like that, wisdom. Boxing has a great history of, um, you know, people from different backgrounds that were like going through struggles, the Italians, the Jewish, the Africans, the, the Mexicans, the English champions, like how they transition through, like boxing teaches you about communities that were going through economic struggle, where they found boxing as a way to earn money and stuff like, because that's where a lot of money was made through combat sport back then. So yeah, just boxing helped shape me a lot. And I think without it, I definitely would have been a lot different. So Brick Lane was the chosen craft, but I feel I would have been a Jack the Lad more so than trying to be like a better person. What do you study? Uh, philosophy, politics, and economics. PPE. 
Yeah. <laughs> As you can see, the environment, <laughs> you know, the environment I'm in <laughs> starts to shape me. So yeah, I learn quick. So yeah, good luck with it. I'm wishing you well. No problem. Sweet. Might have time for just a couple more. Um, I recognise the member with the red watch on the left hand or something. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, you. So boxing is a sport that combines like so many different things. You've got to be strong. Um, you've got to have the endurance to like go 11 rounds if you need to. And you've got to have the sort of craft to be able to like manage a fight and like read your opponent's body language and stuff like that. And also there's like the whole different side of sport, which is like you mentioned, like the nutrition, the sleep. Mm. Um, the making time for things like that which really make the difference so like how much time does it take in a day to like be a world like standard boxer to be a like a world level like a uh, world, world class boxer. boxer so the levels you're at determines that so when i first started it started off three times a week but then on so basically monday wednesday friday but then on the tuesday and thursday i'll hit the gym as well so that would give me a small advantage on my opponents. But now we focus, then there was a time I was training four times a day. So I train in a day more times than I did in a week. And I remember I thought, nah, this ain't for me. Like <laughs> the amount of work that they put us through was, was, yeah, was really torturous. And the UK system is based on hard work. Now we move more into quality over quantity but we're still in the gym about seven hours a day now. Um, so it's, even though it sounds a lot, rather than being in four times a day, we'll just rest for like an hour and a half, straight back, an hour and a half, straight back. Now I have probably between 2 p.m. till six, about a good four hour break to have food and recover. And yeah, you just need about seven hours of quality work, but also it's the research you probably do outside that will separate you from the rest. And I just, I don't know, nature, like what you nurture within yourself, um, the law of attraction, all that type of stuff, prayer, I think it definitely, well, meditation, whatever you want to address it as, makes a difference. So, like, seven hours, but realistically, what our company ethos is and what we stand for is 25-8, you know, no breaks. You, you, you've got to live it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I try and make it sound simple, but no, when I'm looking back, I actually live it fully. So yeah, fully commit yourself, immerse yourself in it. Can I, um, I recognise the member with the red jacket there. And glasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, thank you for being here. Um, so my question is, um, well, it's two questions. The first one is, what do you listen to? Because, I mean, like, you talk about listening to a lot of mot uh, motivational stuff. Yep. But you're Nigerian, and right now, like, Afrobeat is taking over the world. So, and I can see copy in the building. So it only makes sense that I, I bring up that topic. Second question is, how do you deal with um, criticism? Wait, wait. First one. What do you oh, listen to? So is this, is this music or motivational? No, music, music wise. Music wise. Because like, yeah. It's a weird, like, where, who's got my phone now? Have you got it? Can I pass my phone quickly? I'd, maybe a lot, <laughs> I played a lot of songs I was listening to, which will probably be shocked, yeah? So, I like different, no cameras, I had to punch in my passcode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> this was the last song I was listening to which is, does anyone know Charlie Rich in here? Wow, wow, <laughs> wow. Did you know Charlie Rich? No? You know, serious? Yeah. Yeah, so one person in here, so it's this, this one here. I've actually got no signal in here. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Rich, um, honestly, it's just how I'm feeling, because music, sets the tone so many different genres so many different genres so i don't confine myself like to one space i think who's your favorite limiting my favorite would be in what genre 
But I think one of my favourite songs is uh, Whitney Houston. Is it Greatest Love of All or Greatest... I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is this on... Don't tell anyone, yeah? <laughs> All right. I mean, it's DMX. <laughs> it's DMX Rough Riders. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so second question so that I can go. Um, so um, how do you deal with um, criticism, okay, right? he's found a Charlie Rich song. Which one is it? Um, this one. Wait, he wants to play it quickly. Uh, you can't hear it. That's uh, Charlie Rich. <laughs> so, so, did you get my next, my second question? Um, critics. Critics. Yeah, how do you deal uh, with them? Okay, I think critics are good. It's a balance though, because you know critics will will nitpick, and I feel for perfection you need to nitpick, right? So, whether you want to look at it as criticism or constructive criticism is down to you. Um, so if, if you look at the positives of criticism, you can see it as constructive. Don't take it personal. But then you've also just got to look at people that are just genuine haters as well and just not take too much notice of it because your mind is your own critic as well. I'm sure we all have a situation where we just don't feel great. Like we're always questioning ourselves. And I learned this from Mike Tyson listening to him and the minute someone critiques you that isn't constructive, sometimes in your head mentally you've got to tell yourself how great you are 10 times over because the mind sometimes it's like a coping mechanism or a way to survival, like scared all the time and introvert and safety. Um, it takes a lot of willpower and a lot of mind power to sometimes walk in and grace and have no fear and be confident. So criticism is good if you're going to use it to better yourself. But if, it, if criticism is directed at you and it holds you back and holds you down and turns you inwards, I'd really advise you to, to believe in your voice. And if you tell yourself you're not great, just try and tell yourself 10 times over, everyone in here, I'm great, I feel good. I'm great, I feel good, I'm great, I feel good, I look good, I feel good, I'm great at what I do. And you just have to tell yourself that over and over again if, if criticism is used as a negative. That's, that's basically how I deal with criticism. Constructive, positive, or if it's used to bring me down, I have to build myself back up. You have to use criticism as a positive, either way it's thrown at you, basically. Do you get, do you get that philosophy? Yeah, sure. You sure? Yeah. Okay, okay. Are you sure? Because I'm like questioning myself if it makes sense. But you have to use it as a positive. Criticism has to be used as a positive on both ends. And if it's not used as constructive, you have to understand you have to turn it into positive. Because it will just hold you back. It'll hold you back. Doubt isn't good. Doubt is not good. Okay. Um, okay. Go on, copy. Oh, wow. Hello, copy. Yes, the mic. Is that relay running? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm allowed to ask a question because I'm a student at Oxford. Yes. Despite us being very good friends. Now, my question for you is, yeah. Femi, Anthony Joshua. Yeah. What are you not good at? You know, you've sat down and you've spoken about being a warrior mm -hmm. and you've spoken about your ambitions. So outside the ring, without the belts, what are you working on? Because at the end of the day, we're all humans, right? With ambitions. Yeah. I struggle with school. I struggle with a lot of things. Yeah. So how can we leave this lovely evening feeling like, oh, we share something in common with Anthony Joshua? Mm. It's, a great, it's a great question. What am I not good at? I never really thought of that. <laughs> what am I not good at? <laughs> well, how can I use it? This is going back to that 
criticism question, I'm going to critique myself, but what I'm not good at is an avenue to make myself better. Um, I would say I people please a lot. Yeah, I do, I do, I do. I always have people's thoughts at the forefront of what's good for me. And is being selfish good? I think it, it's not bad, is it, when you're looking out for number one? So I think not looking out for number one is something I'm not so good at. And yeah, I just need to find more time to better myself and put myself first and be more present, be more present. Um, I was speaking to one of the students upstairs about this earlier, about being more present and putting myself first. And he, I think, is he in here? Yeah, what, so what was your question that you asked me? Yeah, it was about that mindset. <clears throat> So uh, we, I, I, I mentioned is taking control of situations, like being present. So I put people first a lot of the time, for example, I knew I had to be here today and sleep's a big thing. And I was shattered this morning when I woke up. I had a headache and I was thinking, how have I got a headache on the day I'm coming here? Like of all days, like, so rest, I needed to rest. But I had, a, I had an important phone call scheduled in at one o'clock. So um, athletes, I still love a nap. So I had a time schedule, so taking control of situations and being present. Um, I could have been on the phone to this guy for like two hours and it's someone I respect, or even three hours. But I needed to take control and be present of my situation and be a bit selfish. And I just, I had to cut the conversation short. Because you know sometimes when you're on the phone, probably like I am now, rabbiting on and you're just thinking, shut up. Like I need to, <laughs> you know when someone's on the phone to you and you're thinking, I need to go, but you don't know where to butt in. So I had to be present at that moment and take control of the situation. And um, that's something I need to be better at and be more, what's right for me? Because that person would have loved to have stayed on the phone with me for two, three hours. But ultimately, when we come off the phone, the only person that's going to suffer is me. <laughs> you know, so take more control and be a little bit more selfish because now I'm able to engage and hopefully, I have, I don't know how you guys feel, I've had a really lovely evening with you guys. Thank you. Um, we just got time for just one last very, very short question. Who's uh, the highest bidder? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can feel free, feel free. We'll go, I don't mind answering two, three more, honestly, it's fine. It's fine, it's fine. A large component of your success as a boxer has come from the fact that you're entertaining and you know how to knock people out. Mm. But to beat Ruiz, mm. you had to box with a back foot. Mm -hmm. You had to change your style. Yep. Is professional boxing about the ability to hit and not get hit? Or is it about two strong people just hurting each other? Well, yeah. I think the lady over there asked me, uh, she, she summed up pretty well, like the nutrition, how many hours it takes and stuff. But one thing, as you said, that is naturally given. Punchers are born, they're not made. So if you're, if you're like born heavy handed, like big boned, you definitely have a good chance of making it. Now, what do they say? Um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work. So you have to, like the Ruiz fight, I couldn't just depend on talent, which we spoke about earlier, i.e. the game plan inside of my career now. So the game plan inside of things is so, so important. Um, so the back foot boxing was part of that understanding. A guy that's powerful because he's big and heavy, so gravity pulling him down big, heavy, when he generates that power from the foot up, he's going to generate a lot of force. So I had to definitely add some like, expertise to the God-given talent because at times it's only so far talent will take you and I needed to definitely improve my, my tactical, my tactics in that fight, yeah. Is that, is that, that answers your question, but yeah. where was you trying to go with the question? Well, um, I, sp I feel like prof professional boxing and amateur boxing are very different. Yeah, definitely. And amateur boxing is more about hit. scoring points, and not get hit, hit and not get hit. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, there's a big stereotype that I've heard, heard a lot of people talk about boxing, yep. where they just think it's two people just trying to kill each other. And I don't really agree with that, but I was wondering what you kind of think about that. I don't I agree like with so that either. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. 
but that's what I say, you are born with the punching power. But what, as you get up the, up the ladder, you meet people with the same punching power, the same punch resistance as you, that are just as strong as you, as quick as you, then it comes down to the tactics, the education, the, the science behind the sport, the millimetres, being able to avoid a punch. Because remember, I'm sitting like probably this distance from my opponent, and he's like got his hammer cocked back, ready to explode. So um, yeah, there is that, as I say, reaction drills, timing, nutrition, sleep, how you approach your day and all that type of stuff. It all plays into a big part of um, your success. So I agree with you, to be fair. Do you box? Yeah. Good luck, good luck. <laughs> um, so unfortunately that does conclude tonight's event. Um, <laughs> 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 it's been a phenomenal experience, a genuine pleasure. Once again, Mr. Anthony Joshua. Thank you very much. in era social media. Do I have everyone's confirmation I can take a selfie and put it up on the <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to get in it? Can yeah, you stand in the middle? Yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. Wide screen. Is everyone in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright, we're going to get one more. Alright, after three, we're all going to make a big cheer, yeah? Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Respect, respect, respect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.